let's talk about Pixar's Coco. Coco, uh, this this one, as I mentioned earlier, was directed by Looney, Lee Unkrich, as well as Adrian Molina, who's worked on quite... They've both worked on a lot of Pixar movies. Uh, Adrian Molina, I can't remember another Pixar film that he's co-directed. Uh, I know that he's been a storyboard artist, and he's worked on screenplays, but uh, this I think this might actually be his first co-director, and he also has a writing credit, so... The movie stars Anthony Gonzalez, Gael Garcia Bernal, uh, Benjamin Bratt, Alana Ubach, uh, Rene Victor, and plenty more. A really great cast. Uh, I think I want to say they're all uh, Mexican voice actors, or at least like just Hispanic Latinx voice actors. I, I might be wrong about that, but the film. Uh, well, uh, oh, go ahead. The Good Luck Charm, right? John Rassenberg is in it. I think that's the only person I know that was. Ah, uh, yeah, good point. Good point. <laughs> in the main cast, though, I think like for main characters. But uh, the synopsis is: Aspiring musician Miguel, confronted with his family's ancestral ban on music, enters the land of the dead to work out the mystery of his family. Uh, so let's start with you, Will Ashton. What did you think okay. of Pixar's Coco? Oh boy. I mean, we've talked about a little bit what we felt about the film, so I don't think it's going to be a surprise to say that we haven't I, gone into detail, though. Right, but we have said that. I mean, I really enjoy the film. I haven't made that secret yet. Uh, I do think that, like, I mean, I've mentioned before in the podcast that I hold a soft spot for pretty much every Pixar movie. There isn't one Pixar movie that I outright dislike, but there is, I think, a noticeable difference. And we were talking about this with maybe last year leaving that the last couple of years haven't been their best and brightest besides inside out. Um, it just feels like they haven't had that same magic, that same spark that they had back in their earlier and better days. But this movie Coco, it just feels like a good return to form in every sense. Like it just feels like the Pixar movie that we used to get, you know, on the regular. And it just is so refreshing to see, you know, this new perspective, this new environment, this new, unique personality that we get to see we never got to see in the pixar universe let alone in most other wide release films and it just i mean it's a pretty magical thing to see i mean it just is good wholesome entertainment all the way through i mean i the characters are well realized i don't think the plot is super unique i mean it's kind of formulaic in its style but i think what really makes the film work is that they build the environment and the ancestry of the characters enough that you really feel invested and warmed to who they are and what they represent that you just don't care about those little things and you're so entertained and immersed in this world that it is just such a fun ride and i mean it's all that emotions too that you just love for a pixar movie so there are very few negative things i'm going to say in this review uh what about you matt Zanato? Yeah, I'll say even less negative things because I think this is really – it's going to be probably one of my favorite movies of the year. Um, I can't tell you 100% why right off the bat because it took me a while to like think about it. But uh, you know, the first thing to me is the aspect of family and also the inclusion factor that Pixar is going for here uh, because you have – you know Disney does Moana and you get you know the native culture going on there. And then Pixar comes right back with Coco and they go totally Dia de los Muertos and they – this rich backstory and history uh, you know, from a point of view that many of us viewers don't actually know. You know, it's very heavily uh, religion. It's very heavily all those kind of spiritual influences. Uh, but it, in going to that day of the Deadland, it gives the Pixar animation team so much freedom to have fun with that. Like, it, it's just exploding with different colors, and you get the uh, spirit guide animals, these like pinata colored lions and crap like that. Uh, but also, you know, the story it really hits the end, and I spent the last about. I don't know, 10 minutes, probably like crying through it, like, or choking back, like some kind of tear in some way. You can tell us uh, the truth. You were, the, you were, yeah, I cried. <laughs> I cried for a good half an hour. I'll take it back then. Uh, but no, it, it actually, it's one of the most effective uh, Pixar stories. I will say, I don't think they've done better work since Ratatouille in my eyes, wow. uh, you know, backing, backing off what like Will said is like all the characters are so well realized and the story itself doesn't do anything especially special i mean you have miguel you know trying to find his rock star family member only to find out something else that we won't spoil on this uh but number one the music is absolutely killer number two the technical aspects are tremendous because as someone who plays guitar you know i'm watching these animated characters pulling off strings and doing these things that you know probably more fluid fashion than i could even do in real life 
And um, it just all comes down to that animation factor, and it just looks so good. Story can get you so far, and it gets you halfway there, but this the actual visuals and the actual immersion that Pixar does in Coco is, it just really goes above and beyond. It, you know, you feel the sense of camaraderie and family going on here so heavy. Hmm. Wow. Uh, man, I'm, I'm agreeing with so much of what you're saying. I do want to make a comment about, uh, well, there, there's another movie about Dia de los Muertos. And uh, it, it's... The Book of Life? There, there's yeah, a movie Book called Life. Book of Life. And if you've been following any sort of Pixar news at all, you'll know that people have been kind of complaining that like Coco just looks like a ripoff of that movie. And I've been a vocal, vocal critic of those critics because like, I liked book of life. That's, that's a fine film. It's nice. It's, it's Guillermo del Toro at his best, uh, in terms of like just environments and, uh, you know, just character design. And I know like, you know, Matt, you just saw his newest movie shape of water and like, (laughs) So, you know, like, I'm not, not to knock at all what Del Toro did with that film, but that film, what it did with did, it's such a different thing. This Coco is so, like, if you, I, I almost want to, like, predict that people are going to be making Boom Goes the Dynamite jokes, if you're familiar with those. Like, oh, someone goes to the land of the dead and there's music, you know what I mean? But Coco is such a wonderfully original thing because uh, I, I want to talk about specifically two things. Uh, the, the underlying message of the film, uh, in terms of like how, how they relate culture and how Mex, how they relate Mexican culture to something that people all over the world can understand. Yep. Uh, there's that. And then there's this other thing where they don't just take the idea of remembering your family, you know, where, oh, I remember my family, pass on their story. That, that's a big, like, emotional heart of the film. But they also have this secondary message, and it's almost just as strong, where it's saying, what would you give up to chase your passions, to realize your ambitions? That was where the movie got me the most, because it, it does what I do. Th- I think what Pixar has been doing really well uh, in the last few years, even if their worlds haven't been the most creative since Inside Out, you know, mainly because it's cars and finding Dory. And, you know, they, these are, these are movies that aren't necessarily taking us to like places we've never seen before. Right. And I think, Will, that's where a lot of that Pixar magic tends to come from. We could also say about story too, but there, there are things that I really liked about cars three and finding Dory and the good dinosaur to an extent and inside out where they, you have this, you have this deconstruction of an idea that we take for granted, follow your heart is an idea we take for granted. And Coco kind of brings up like, yeah, 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 but slow down. Family is also important. And like following your heart can lead to some dark things because what if your heart sucks? And like stuff like that is where I love Pixar the most because we know they're really good at archetypes and just making worlds out of things we've never considered being emotionally invested in, like toys and bugs and monsters. Here, they're making us... They've done that there for an entire culture, you know, for Mexican culture and a holiday that, uh, as Matt said, we don't have a lot of context for and experience with, but you learn a lot about this holiday. You learn about its values and it's all in a just very entertaining and well-done story. And I do agree. I think we both all agree that the story is pretty predictable. And honestly, I wasn't really in it until getting into like the second act, but yeah. It, it's form. It is formulaic, and you. A lot of people will see it coming. What? Why do you guys think it doesn't ruin the movie? Because I'm still sort of trying to figure that out. Because it didn't ruin it for me, and I think in other movies it would have. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I think. Oh god. Oh, no, go you, ahead, sorry, you, no, no, <laughs> no, you go ahead. No, Matt. I'm handing it to no, you. you. Nope. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, no, I, I was just gonna say that I do think, like I was saying before, that it is the uniqueness of the perspective and the environments that really makes it stand out. Like because. They spent so much time developing everything else around the film. You're engulfed in it and you want to be more invested in it. And also it just flows really well. It's a very entertaining film. It's pretty consistent with the jokes and just keeping it uh, pretty, you know, pretty fast going. Uh, And I don't know. I mean, like, I don't think like it's not like a plot we've seen like a hundred times. But I mean, I just think the predictability of it doesn't necessarily detract the way it could have, I guess, because. It doesn't. I don't. I, I mean, I, I my thoughts here might have to dwell in spoilers, so I'll let Matt go ahead. Well, I was just gonna yeah. say. I mean, Pixar always kind of aims right for the heart, and yeah. you know, 
to what you were saying, John, they're always going to pull off some kind of, you know, even if it's not family oriented, they're going to pull off some message that hits and resonates with everyone in the audience. And in Coco, they do it, you know, times 10. It Everyone is family. Everyone has that kind of feeling of being pushed in a corner and, you know, oh, my family doesn't love me and blah, blah, blah. But like, no, you idiot, they do. And it's so simple, but it's something that you don't see wholly often. So mm. Coco kind of dives right into it. Also, I really like the dealing with the afterlife in this film, uh, which is not an easy thing for a child to go into. And, you know, I'm sure kids have plenty of questions about death and the unknown and stuff like that. I mean, we all do. Uh, but the way Pixar handles it is something that's not scary. It's not off-putting, and yeah. it, it kind of brings the whole kind of realm of the unknown and land of the dead, and it's a really like sweet message that kids can kind of feel okay about. And they're, they're not going to have those awkward questions afterwards where, like, I made some dumb comparison in my review, though, but about, like, storks, and it's like, okay, all, all storks does is raise so many questions about where babies come from for children, and poor parents afterwards going to be like, uh, yeah, so that's not really how it happens. Where, <laughs> but with like Coco, I mean, you, there, those questions aren't going to be there. Kids are going to walk away thinking like, you know, Oh, you know, when grandma, grandpa passes away, something like that. Like not to get like deep and heavy here, but right. it, it works and it works so well. And it just kind of has that com- like that family aspect. Again, I'm going to keep saying it. It just, you know, it just hits you right in the heart. You can't avoid it. Uh, have you guys listened to the version of the soundtrack that's all in Spanish? No. No, it, not yet. <laughs> it is so much better. It, it, like, the music in this is pretty good. It's uh, Michael Giacchino, and I, I love it. I, I've, listened to the, I've been listening to the soundtrack constantly because I think, I think the song Remember Me is just one of easily one of Pixar's best original songs and uh, waterworks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there are a few other really good ones here and they're so much better. Like when they're in like fully Spanish, un poco loco is one that just, <laughs> I know it, <laughs> I, I'm obsessed with that song because of the way that the way that they sing it, like in the actual Spanish, when it's not like the Spanglish sort of thing, it's a little smoother. And I really, I can't wait to watch this movie completely in Spanish. And, that that was a feat as well. I think uh, you touched on this too, Matt. One of, one of the most impressive things about this movie is the fact that they made the skeleton design uh, not too scary, right? Like not scary at all, really. But like, I don't. They still made it fun. Like they were able to make right. something that could have been really creepy and something that would have been like kind of gross horror or something that would have begged a lot of questions, like the Cars universe, right? Instead of that, we get just this universe that like makes a lot of sense for some weird reasons. We, we get introduced to, uh, to rules of the afterlife that, yeah, they don't feel forced. They don't stretch and they're just, it's just simple. And I, I don't know, it, it, really good world building here. Well, I think that's more the magic of Pixar where, you know, going back to the skeleton forms, I mean, they literally are just bones floating in place. There's no connectors. There's no weird, like kind of configuration. It's literally just all the bones floating in place, but that gives Pixar this weird kind of freedom to have, contorted motions and heads spinning off and stuff like like it gets so cartoonish but in a way that doesn't seem overly goofy like it's yeah. it's just so hard to hit that balance and like you know we're talking in circles here saying the same thing almost but just pixar is so good at bringing people into a story and getting them lost in it that's the whole thing never once did i sit there going like all right there's talking skeletons and a flying pinata monster and like it's like crap like that like none of that made sense in the story because you know i'm totally invested in if miguel's gonna even get out of the land of the dead alive and, you and know, if the frida kahlo kind of is going to yeah. have her her masterpiece unfold i could have watched her making sculptures for like however long that movie was i, I swear to god i i adore all those inside references you know that i had to look up because i wasn't familiar like i had never heard of alabrijes i never heard of fria Kahlo. like i guess not in the, heard of, i've heard of her but like you know what i mean like yeah but like, say, yeah. i didn't, didn't <laughs> know on. much about like it's just one of those names but like in that country like she's you know obviously like so well known and it's just i don't know it was such a good uh, it, it was just such a good joke that they did with like Hector dressing up as her. Not a spoiler happens really early on. And I, I, I just really appreciate like the inside things. Like I, I think they make references too to like artists and uh, music talents. And you, you oh, really get a, a yeah, like you get, you get yeah. a real sense of it. And it, 
I did, I, that, it's that inclusivity that you mentioned, Matt. Will, what negative things do you want to say about Coco? Negative things? Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I was just going to say real quick on the Frida thing is that, like, I think one thing that's really impressive about the film is that something like that could have been really tasteless or really shallow. And I like that the movie was never that. Like, I, I almost think, thought like, they said her name wrong to, like, be a parody of it instead of the real person. And then. Well, I mean, awkward. the unibrow is pretty, you know, yeah. telling it. <laughs> dead giveaway yeah Yeah. i mean but uh negative things i mean we were talking a bit about this and i think even though the second half of the film is really where the film comes live there are a couple things that i think narratively felt a little rushed or they they didn't quite come together as satisfying as i want and i'm not talking about the main stuff i'm talking more like some of the minor subplots that i feel like for the sake of making the film a tight like 105 minutes Mm -hmm. they kind of had to be like okay like you we just need to tighten this. Let's let's get to the next thing because the movie's in this perpetual state of motion that to slow it down, like one key moment would um, kind of disrupt the flow of the film. So I, I don't know what the best outcome for that one subplot would be, but I do find that's a pretty big negative for the I film. Think, I think I know what you're talking about. We talked about this and without yeah. without delving into spoilers, there there is a subplot involving the like head matriarch of the land of the dead and sort of just like what happens with her. And it, it, yeah, I agree completely. It does feel a little rushed. And and I I think I want to see the movie again because I kind of want to reevaluate like how all that stuff goes down. Yeah. Because yeah, there, there was something that left a bad taste in my mouth, but it could just be the movie felt rushed because we were seeing it for the first time. I'm not sure. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about that? Not really, because oh. I. <laughs> yeah, so we, I don't we like can you talk about the negatives. <laughs> we can talk about more in spoilers because I feel like it's worth discussing. But I would also say that I also wasn't super crazy about how they disposed of the villain. I found, but I'll, I'll talk about that I more agree. as well. I agree completely with that, actually. Um, but okay, it sounds like we've reached the end of our our bridge of petals, and uh, we need to we need to do our final <laughs> thoughts and grades so we can get into some spoilers. Uh, let's wrap it up then, Matt Zanotto, What are your final thoughts and grade for Coco? A uh, final thought is that Coco finds about ninety nine percent more life in the dead than it, you know, a regular movie might it with like reality. And uh, I'm, I mean, going off my grade on We Got Discovered, I'm giving it a four point four point five out of five. Awesome, that's like a, gosh, a it, that's an A minus. It indeed is fantastic. Uh, Will Ashton, William, yeah, what about you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like we said before, this movie's a celebration. Is the warm, inclusive, wholesome movie that we need this year after just tons of just really bad things going down. This is just like that warm blanket of a movie that feels like, oh, yeah, there are still things that you can cherish in this world and feel protective about. Mm. And similar to Lady Bird, if this movie doesn't make you connect to your family, I mean, you you might be uh, dead. You, you might be Maverick. <laughs> no, no pun intended here. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to give it an A minus as well. Well, uh, my final thoughts are simple. Uh, I, I honestly just think that the, Coco is a testament to the idea that good things happen to those who wait. And movies that take five years, or and actually in Coco's case, it kind of, I think the idea was first pitched seven years ago. But movies that take their time and aren't rushed and come out when they need to come out, not so that they can come out before Book of Life in order to prove something uh, because of what happened with Newt, for example, that whole thing with Rio. It R. just R. proves. Yeah, I know, right? It, it just proves. I wanted to see Newt. I know. I know. I, I feel like the Rio thing was just not a good reason. But anyway, yeah. I think when we see a movie that Pixar doesn't give up on and they keep going forward with, you really see a story that's as polished as can be. And that's, that's pretty close to what we get with Coco, you know, flaws aside. And I think that it, it's definitely good enough to, to stand up with some of Pixar's very best. So, uh, the, for the first time in Cinema Holics, I think this is a triple A minus episode. Cause I am one as well. Yeah. Holy poop. We've never had a triple A. Good report a. card. That's never happened. I don't think. Oh boy. Thanks to Will Ashton, but oh well. Did we give a trip away to um, Ladybird? No, I don't think so. Cause well, okay, just, yeah, Maverick wasn't there for the. I don't remember. I don't remember at all. Okay. Maybe, maybe we did. I should keep track of these things, shouldn't I? Anyway, so that's our review. Of- Thanks for listening. To hear more Cinemaholics, including this episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and wherever else you love podcasts. See you next time.